For years, decades even, entrepreneurship has been declining in the United States and black entrepreneurship has lagged behind even more. That all changed in the last two years. Will it last today on Culture Builder Live? Hey there, I am Chris Wink. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Technically, a news organization that serves a community of technology professionals and entrepreneurs. Uh, today, we're having a conversation around Black entrepreneurship, specifically what has changed in the last 18 months and will it last? To do that, I'm joined by Lakeisha Greenway. She is the president and founder of Wearable Tech Ventures. She's also the founder with Lucky Fit, a coaching platform. Lakeisha, thanks for being here. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Chris. We're, we're, we're a fan of your work, so I'm glad to be able to have the conversation. So let's start with a couple basics. These might be painfully basic, but I think it sets up our, our conversation first. Um, there has been an important conversation on diversifying entrepreneurship. Let's connect the dots. Why are we quite concerned with diversifying entrepreneurship? Why is it a priority? Diversifying entrepreneurship is a key factor to overall um, developing and maintaining a power as a country <laughs> mm. with, with innovation, but then also making sure that there's representation. And when we look at the opportunities that entrepreneurship brings, it helps to not only stimulate the economy, but it provides opportunities for families and for additional investments into other sectors in the future. You, you hit on two big, you know, this is a famous lost Einstein's report of the last um, decade or so, noting that if you, if you simply expect a certain percentage of a population to be patent holders, if you expect a certain percentage of any given population to create economic growth and productivity gains, you'd expect it to be pretty consistent across race. When we see a lack of that, the concept of lost Einsteins are that we just have simply lost opportunities for economic gain because of lack of disinvestment. You hit on that. You also hit on a degree of, 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 of wealth inequality, that we know that entrepreneurship is one path, not the only path, but one exactly. path to the possibility of, of wealth creation. That, that's somewhat resonant with you? Absolutely. Wealth creation is something that we all should be striving for. And in many cases, traditional means of working did not provide that. Um, and what we know based off of, you know, the, the factors over the past few years is that the middle class has been shrinking. So if there is not a, a preface or a statement that is placing priority on entrepreneurship, what we could see is a greater gap within the wealth gap. Mm. You, you, um, so then to take, let's take this next step. We tend to care about tech, tech, tech enabled companies because at least in this moment of digital transformation, that's where we've seen massive productivity gains. We've seen a degree mm -hmm. of value creation, heightened capacity for wealth creation. So the conversation, conversation we were aiming to have was why is there been a lack of block up entrepreneurship in technology in particular, mm -hmm. because we see it as a, as a lens of, of a lens for wealth creation. So this similarly may be apparent, you and I were joking a little bit about this before we started, but let's just test the premise. Mm -hmm. Why have there been a disproportionately fewer number of black tech entrepreneurs? Let's set that table right. Absolutely. Great question. And, and I'd like to segue first from the original question about entrepreneurship. So what we know based off of the demographics that typically lead culture shifts uh, that make culture iconic, in many cases, you're going to look at the black community. However, what has been presented in the media have been, and this is not a bad thing necessarily, black entrepreneurs that are dominating in sectors such as uh, hair care um, and other type of body care type items. And at, at a certain point, you have to wonder how come other tech innovators or those that are leading innovation in another realm are not highlighted? How come uh, these particular groups are only representative more in hair care and or food? Now, when we look into the tech sector specifically, um, in many cases, those that have gone through the pathway of education from high school to college, in many cases, pr even prior to the pandemic, the path of entrepreneurship or the path to the startup world was not promoted. If anything, the message was go get a good job <laughs> and you could join one of these professional organizations and help to stimulate the STEM pool, if you will. Now, when we look at the startup world, 
there are a number of different uh, factors that are have inhibited uh, previously the emergence or the presence of Black startup founders in particular. And so when we look at the funding profile or the funding pathway, uh, in many cases we see in the media uh, an emphasis on VCs, venture capitalism. And what some people do not know is that the VC platform is not the first step. And so there has to be tremendous traction in order for a startup to even reach the profile or the step to uh, receive VC funding. And so in many cases, it starts with families, friends, and fools at the three Fs, as we say in business school, and also angel investors. And so when you do not have appropriate pools of funding to help stimulate your startup from that beginning sector, and if you do not have a network that is supportive from that angel investor network, and if you do not have a network of supportive advocates and mentors that are going to provide and introduce you to pivotal relationships, in many cases, we will not see the startups that gain that traction that can be presented to VCs. Now, the last thing is when we talk about the VC world, VCs typically do not invest in everything. So there are particular niches and particular sectors that VCs will invest in. So if you have a VC that has a limited experience and may not understand where a, a non-traditional or underrepresented founder is coming from, in many cases, they will dismiss the innovation that is coming from that particular founder and there's missed opportunity. However, there are many programs in place now that are providing pipelines of talent, not only from the tech founder, but also from the angel investor to the VC to increase representation and Whirlpool Tech Ventures is a part of that. I think you're on mute there, Chris. I can't believe I did the mute thing live. <laughs> um, you hit on an important point there of, of some concentric circles or some, some at least related circles. Entrepreneurship um, tends to, to be um, like typically aligned with people who have support systems, who have access to capital, e even if that might mean their own safety net. Not always the case, yes. but typically disproportionately true. Then inside entrepreneurship, we have some folks who are tech and tech enabled, which usually requires a degree of familiarity with technology. So if you're from a community that has had a, a lack of investment in, in education in and around advanced technologies, if you were in a community that you did not have access to, to, to additional computers or the like, you, you're going to miss that early wave of playing with technology. And then you were hitting on a third, even narrower group, fewer than 1% of incorporated businesses are ever going to take on outside financing, venture capital or other forms of private equity. Very small sliver will ever do that. And you're alluding that's like a, an even smaller group that is further backed on, on network effects and the like. So that, that funnel down toward venture backed tech or tech enabled firms, there are a lot of hoops for why existing disinvestments, institutional racism, a whole lot of reasons are gonna, gonna play into factors of why that, those groups get, keep getting smaller. Here's where we're gonna turn this on our heads though. The last two years have been really weird for a whole bunch of reasons. One of them is, you know, we at Technique for years have been reporting on declining rates of entrepreneurship. That radically changed in 2020. Rates of incorporation spiked. And not just, oh, I'm trying to get PPP money, but true incorporations um, that in, in, intended to hire employees. Then we saw in 2021, it, it, uh, some data first from Brookings, but then some census data backed this up that, I'm sorry, BLS data backed this up that black rates of entrepreneurship were outpacing white and Asian American groups, which as far as I understand, it had, had never shown up in the data for at least the longest period of time. So something really seismic has taken place in the last two years. Uh, talk to me a little bit about this, Lakeisha. Do you view this as a moment in time? Is this a paradigm shift? Does this change last? Because if we want to make lasting change and undo wealth inequality issues, or at least want to address rates of entrepreneurship, we would actually need Black Americans to outpace other race groups to make up that ground. So. Do you see this moment as lasting? Is this, does this seem like a crucial moment to you? 
I'm so glad you asked that. And there's a couple different answers to that. But number one, do I see that it's going to last? Absolutely. And the reasons for that vary. Number one, let's address the elephant in the room. Many corporations have taken to the sympathy play based mm. off of, you know, creating funds and initiatives for racial injustice. And so in many cases, they're saying, where's that person of color? Where's that black person that we can reach to to say that, hey, we support these initiatives and we're sorry for what happened and what was recorded on the streets. Right. Mm. So that's I mean, just calling it like it is. That's number one. Number two, with the introduction of Web3 with the increased usage of social media. There are a number of different platforms and ways that entrepreneurs can introduce their products, their innovations to society. And therefore the traction and the attraction is inevitable because the numbers won't lie. The last thing is the concept of underrepresented and a, a target of many organizations um, using this particular term. Historically, we would say, that these are groups of people that have not been invited to the table. Whereas where now we see a lot of corporations that are saying, hey, we want you to come to the table. Now, what they want them to come to the table for is still something that is to be determined. However, there's a shift that is occurring that is saying, hey, we want you to come to the table. We want to explore. And by the way, we may want to help you with your network. So you'll see a number of organizations providing mentoring and maybe some advising. And there's still some work to be done to ensure that those that are saying that they really want to do that, that they're really putting their, their money behind that to assist us, us uh, black startup founders and tech startup founders, period, to gain traction for success. You, I will lose you here in a, in a couple of minutes. So let's turn to how others contribute to ensuring this lasts. You, you, you speak to a, a, a few big trends um, that might support it. Wearable Tech Ventures, your own effort, my understanding is you have a, a goal to grow the number of black and brown entrepreneurs who are doing work in and around wearable tech. Um, talk to me a little bit about what you and others are doing and what you maybe can expect all anyone who's participating in a tech innovation economy. How do we ensure that black rates of entrepreneurship continue to advance, particularly in and around tech and tech enabled products? Thank you. And, and I'm a unicorn in a sense that I am a black woman <laughs> that is seeking to transform tech and support 100 uh, wearable tech startups by 2030. But they're not just black and brown. Mm. There are also startups, you know, from founders that may be autistic, have ADHD, dyslexia, mm. maybe seeing hearing impaired. Um, and so basically I'm saying, hey, before you may have been invited to the table, you have a unique perspective and we want to bring that here to develop technology and build up the wearable tech sector. I can tell you that we've partnered with the National Institutes of Health in the NIH. And so we are working with them as mentors and advisors for a new uh, boot camp accelerator where we're asking researchers and um, startup founders and people with just I with ideas to come to the table and help solve the age old problem of uh, Alzheimer's and, and um, dementia. So with partnerships such as that, uh, where there is mentoring, where there is funding and support, by the way, there's a total $300,000 available to founders mm. that enter into this and, and they can um, go to the informational meeting on April 20th. That's one instance of something where we're approaching this from an early stage founder perspective. There are also other funds that are out there that are focused on entrepreneurship specifically um, and grants uh, where folks can apply for that so that they can gain some traction in this space. So I think when you have people that have been dismissed previously that are competent and finally get in a place where they can champion the cause for new innovations to come to play, we'll begin to see more initiatives like this, such as the one that I'm, I'm helping to lead and others around the country are helping to lead to make sure that we're identifying that talent, give them the support and also provide the network necessary so that they can get to the VC round if they choose. Well put there. And and again, a theme throughout this conversation is if you simply follow the straightforward logic of a certain percentage of all of us are going to have the aptitude to do the economic change work we need. Um, anytime we're below that threshold, we are all missing out on those inventions, innovations. And, and Lakeisha, your work in trying to gain more of that for us all is much appreciated. 
Um, given that we're at time, I'm going to have to leave it there. Lakeisha, uh, thanks so much for the work that you're doing and for the conversation. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Chris. That is this week's Culture Builder Live. As always, we are coming headlong into our introduced conference that will take place live um, Thursday, May 12th. And we have a series of conversations leading up to that. Make sure to check that out. We'll drop links uh, to that below the video as we will also uh, make sure to link out to what Wearable Tech, Tech Ventures is doing. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Bye.